I'll officially call to order the regular meeting of Coachella Valley Water District Board of Directors here in Coachella. It is September 26, 2023, and would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Yes. Good morning, President Powell. Here. Vice President Estrada. Here. Here. Oh my goodness. Director Bianco. Here. Director Aguilar. Here. And Director Nelson. All here. Thank you. Sharing, we're sharing. Do we have any additions, deletions, or adjustments to today's agenda? I'm not aware of any. Yes, sir. Okay. I had to figure out which microphone I was using. I just passed that one over to you. All right. Take Jeff's. Yeah, he never yeah, says anything. Yeah, All right. I'm <laughs> we're working out over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that, Council? I, I didn't hear you. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to comment at this time? Yes, Mr. Uh, President, we have Mr. John Carella with City of Cathedral City. Oh, I apologize, he's commenting on item 8A, so we'll take you up at that time. Right, so yeah. Yes. Or you can do both, John, whatever you want. You could, you could comment now if you want to, or we can take it if it's specific to that item, we can take it at that time. It is. I, it is. I apologize. I missed I think it. we'll get there really fast. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so. so let me just verify on Zoom. I'm just off this morning. I apologize. Um, if there's any members of the public on Zoom that would like to uh, provide public comment, uh, please use the raise hand feature at this time. Give them a minute. Okay. I do not see anyone at this time. Okay, good. If you uh, let, see if anyone, let me know. Uh, s special presentation and recognitions. Um, we had a couple of retirements and some anniversaries. Those are noted on the screen, and we don't have any of them attending, so um, we wish them well if they're retiring, and we thank them for their service. And for the anniversaries, we hope they stay on even longer. We have uh, item 6A through G on the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve that? I'll move the consent calendar for approval. I'll second. Okay. We have a motion a second. Um, all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passed 5-0. And 8-A. Do we have a presentation on 8-A? Maybe we'll take the presentation and then the public comment. Yeah. Let's do that. David Wilson, good morning. So we're just drawing straws back there to see who will come in. I was <laughs> waiting for the, for the response. <laughs> Red is on, right? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the purpose of this project is to authorize the general manager to execute a professional services agreement with Michael Baker International in the amount of $175,382 for engineering and um, environmental design uh, support for the North Cathedral City Regional Stormwater Project and to approve additional expenditures, which includes staff costs and contingency for a total amount of $205,382. Uh, the North Cathedral City Regional Stormwater Project is intended to capture um, a portion, approximately 50% of the flood hazards that are coming out of the Morongo Basin, which is about a, a little over a 200 square mile basin as we just experienced with Hillary that conveys flows right to Interstate 10 and along Interstate 10. So this project is intended to capture those, uh, like I said, about 50% of those flows and convey them under an existing culvert with, um, under the railroad <coughs> and get them into the Whitewater River. Um, we have expressed some concern with Michael Baker in the past. Uh, this particular group that we're working with has been involved uh, since day one. In fact, one of the staff members used to work with CBWD on the environmental component. The environmental component here uh, involves uh, uh, um, the Coachella Valley Conservation Commission, CDFW, Army Corps, uh, BLM, <laughs> 
and there's quite a few components, moving parts, and we would like to maintain continuity uh, with the same team. This team has been very responsive. They're not the same group that we've had problems with in the past, and so we would just like to continue on with this group and finish this up so we can get this out to bid. And I'll take any questions. So I, I just have, uh, first of all, I'm glad to see the project uh, moving forward, and we'll hear from John as well. So thank you, David, for that. But um, I, I also raised the question, as you know, about MBI and the comment that was made in, in the staff report. But based on what you said and what we heard, I heard from Kerry, uh, we feel as though, because of the particular division that you're using for this project, that you're not going to have the problem with uh, performance. So I just wanted to make, make that point. And then the, the other question is, on, on the map, can you just indicate for me where the flows actually come from Morongo is it uh, versus um, uh, the other floodwaters, well, the other storm drain? I'll be doing a presentation at the next board meeting, which will probably give you a better picture, but it's, it's way north. I don't know how else to say that without a picture, and I apologize I'll I don't have one, but up and to the left. <laughs> okay. But it's the Morongo <laughs> Basin. It goes, it goes all the way up past uh, Highway 62. And as I said, it's, a, it's over 200 square mile okay. watershed. Okay. And then um, just one final comment, um, John. I, I understand the, the city this week, I believe, and I don't know if John's going to mention this, has an item on their agenda where they're going to be uh, asking for uh, almost three and a half million, four million, something like that, to remove the, um, the mud that's piled on Date Palm that occurred um, uh, during the flood that was removed from the homes. And, um, and of course, there isn't any identified federal or state resource that we know of at this point that can help pay for that. So I'm thinking that it, it might be useful, um, Jim, to maybe have Cathedral City staff maybe talk with our legislative staff about uh, trying to get more attention on these project costs from Washington and the Biden administration, which I understand has not been terribly responsive. So I'd like to put in a, a, a cue for that and, um, and see if we can help somehow. So that was my question. Thank you, David. Sure. Yeah. So, so David, is back to the map question. Is that interchange right there? Is that Gene Autry, or which interchange is that? It has got to be. Uh, this is. Um, it looks like Gene Autry. It's cutting yeah, it's right, across, right, right across that desert. So, Gene Autry? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> okay, great. Yeah, I was just looking to see where the water went after that. So, on Google Maps. So, it's helpful. Yeah. And, David, I had, I just, to get a better sense of this, too, I, I, I was wondering if. Does, does, does this tie to that overall stormwater project that we were looking at building levees from kind of south to north? Um, or is no, there's another uh, item coming up in a couple of minutes, which is that's the Thousand Palms Flood Control Project. Okay, and so that, that doesn't, that's not tied to this at all? There is a bit of a nexus. The flood hazards that are tributary to Thousand Palms um, are mitigated by this project. There are some flood hazards that run along the 10, <coughs> as we just saw, that do go all the way down to the Thousand Palms. This was the one that you saw here. Yeah. Address. Yes, um, I, yeah. I, yeah, so I recall, uh, yeah. I just, yeah. some of these projects we've been looking at them for some years, and I do recall that at one point we did some some uh, hydrology modeling specifically along what we used to call the messenger area. Mm -hmm. Was this it? Yes, the Cathedral City uh, master plan analysis that we performed back in, I want to say it was 2013. Yeah. Um, it shows all the flood hazards and the messenger property was part of that as well. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, so we've been looking at this for a while and <coughs> We, we, we know that uh, that this is an area that, that we need to address, so I'm also happy to see that it's moving yeah. forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for public comment. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable President, Vice President, fellow directors, uh, John Corella, Public Works Director for City of Cathedral City. 
Uh, as you know, we were really impacted by these storm flows. Uh, everything followed what the firm maps showed as far as water flow. The interesting thing about this flood was there's, it was a lot of mud flow, and how it accumulated mud is something that uh, we're talking to Riverside County Flood Control because obviously it started on the eastern slope of San Gregorio Mountains and came down and accumulated the flows. Um, that bodes the question, uh, in, I'm going to integrate this in my public comment that we're really looking for the water district to support a task force that works with Cathedral City as the community agency, Riverside County Flood Control, the regional agency, Coachella Valley Water District, meet and get together and kind of identify this on a regional basis so it doesn't happen again. I know we got all the brain power here. It just, uh, in our communications, it helps the public know that we're really working to the effort and keeping it going. And I will work with uh, your general manager on that, who has been very responsive in emails on <laughs> dealing with the public out there. The public has big question marks on what happened. Uh, city has done its effort to take care of things on public property assisted them minimally on taking their debris from their private property uh, and the mud from their private property. We're allowing them to dump it into the streets and we pick it up. I know the water district has done a great job at cleaning out the sewers. We've had some challenges where they don't understand that the lateral is theirs. They got to clean it out, but the main lines are clear. Uh, just communication we're working with with your staff, and I appreciate staff's effort in getting those communications done. Uh, what I, on the item itself, uh, it's always good to have someone from the community and or public uh, um, uh, supporting the item. So we support this item. Uh, years back in the mid-2000, uh, Four or five, uh, the water dis or excuse me, the city of Cathedral City did contribute half a million dollars through the Dur Verano development to improvements in flood control in this area. This project itself will change the firm map in that area. It'll take some people out of the flood zone. It won't take the whole area out of the flood zone. It'll put a few people into the flood zone. Michael Baker, who's been knee deep in this project. Uh, has already identified those locations. Obviously, there will be that firm mapping done, but as stated by staff, uh, this flood control, what you see there, did not go underneath the uh, trestles of the Whitewater or the Union Pacific Railroad. It just went straight down. It didn't even go into the Verano development, and then right when it hit Date Palm Drive, it took a direct south turn. Uh, this floodplain actually goes all the way to Bob Hope, so it has ramifications all over. So long story short, support the project, appreciate the uh, district getting involved in uh, working with the residents of Cathedral City on various challenges uh, in conjunction with that. Thank you very much. Thanks, hey, John. Thanks, John. And si since you're here, I have a question. Where, where, where was it that the railroad washed out? Um, along there, do you do you happen to know? Was it closer to Ginatri or Bob Hope or or there at Date Palm? They had various locations. They had a right near Ginatri, right in f to the east of Ginatri. Mm -hmm. uh, went out there and looked at it. They had uh, cars float off uh, the track. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had a siding there with cars that f uh, went off the track. Um, but they had a uh, derailment there, and then further down the line uh, where the whitewater crosses underneath this. And I think your staff would little, know a little bit more about that, uh, that they got Those a wash areas. out there, okay. too. So they had, they had two locations. I heard there was a third location, too. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. John, I just have one final question. The, uh, I've gotten some feedback from folks about that uh, mud pile. Um, a date bomb that, that you're working on. When will that be removed? Well, tomorrow night uh, we're presenting, today's Tuesday, it's been a long few weeks. Um, tomorrow night we're going to present a four and a half million dollar uh, soils removal contract for 150,000 yards of soil that needs to go anywhere. So if 
I wish this project was going in soon so that we can deliver the soil to that location. So uh, we're going to hire a contractor to move that out. It is going to take them all the way till May to move <clears throat> that much Jeez. soil out of there. And once again, uh, as director stated, there has been uh, the support you get from Cal OES, the county, are minimal compared to what a federal declaration on FEMA is. We've been working with uh, all our congressmen in the area and our senators. But Water District has a big voice, and we always appreciate that support to be able to help ourselves as well as other communities affected by the storm, because that's where the real money comes and the reimbursements can come from. So, so 150,000 yards, how many truckloads and where are you going to put it? I knew you were going to ask me that. And I, <laughs> I, I've been dealing with numbers, so I'm, I, I'm Is it divided by uh, you know, 10 yards a load. So, so, fi so 15,000 yeah. truckloads, 15,000 truckloads, mm -hmm. <laughs> running in super tens. But uh, take actually, it? the um, the contractor is probably going to use belly dumps, so you can half that. It depends where they're going to dump it to. And uh, unfortunately, they if there's going to be FEMA re uh, reimbursement. You got to know where it's going cradle to grave because technically, if FEMA is going to pay you and reimburse it, they <coughs> own it too. So they want to know where it's going. So you don't have a home for it yet. The contractor, it's up to the contractor to, to find that, that home. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't know if we could be helpful or not, but I'm, I'm just looking at, you know, on this map, that, that berm that comes uh, north south, exactly north south on that. Well, that's Genotri, but um, yeah, that's Genotri. But just to the right of Genotri, actually where that water comes down, it comes down into that berm right there. And um, right here on the, mm -hmm. on the right, um, seems to me that um, in any flood control project, we'd have to build that up to, to handle that kind of flow. Um, that might be a potential staging area. You know, I'm not the engineer, but a potential staging area for all that dirt. And it's so, so dang close. Um, I don't know if that's the material that the engineers might need, but um, you know it's 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 pretty close. So mm -hmm. that you might you guys might give that a thought. Hmm. I like Director Nelson's thoughts, so keep going with that. Yeah. Thank you, I mean, sir. I, maybe. Thank you. Yes, thanks, John. We'll have to investigate land ownership. Right. Right. Yeah. If I may, for the for the record, uh, the project itself is a hundred year. It's it's intended to its size for the hundred year flood. So the Hillary storm was measured as as high as a thousand year flood. So I just wanted to be clear that while this will remove the statutory requirement for folks to have uh, a FEMA supported flood insurance, it does not necessarily remove folks from from a thousand year floodplain. Yeah. At one point, the district was pursuing a standard design, standard flood design, which is 500 years. Mm -hmm. And you may remember that we changed that because of the expenses yeah. involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, even at, at, at 1,010 times more volume, if you just want to use some, and I'm sure that's not accurate. But, you know, it's just, it, it would be really cost prohibitive for us to design anything for that. And the return on investment, you know, if once every 1,000 years mm -hmm. we have a storm like that, even though we had two in two weeks. Um, you know, the idea is that time warp based on, yeah, yeah. based on probability um, <laughs> and the best use of funds, you know, that's what we're trying to pursue. Well, it's now we can go 2,000 years without it. No. Well, we're struggling with 100. Uh, right well, I mean, we've had microbursts. We've had two in La Quinta. We've had them in Indian Wells that, you know, just are really intense storms in a limited area. This, unfortunately, took out a much larger. Uh, it was a lot much larger impact to both the west and then two weeks later in the east, um, both thousand year floods. So it's uh, it's it's tough to try and plan yes. and then execute. Yeah, it's it's so random about where it hits too. It, it you know I mean nobody's safe. It, it's going to be somewhere you don't know where. And mm -hmm. I mean I've lived here my whole life. I've been through a lot of these things. I mean you had two in Indian Wells that just. <laughs> 
yeah. really no place else but Indian Wells, and it did create quite a bit of yeah, La, La Quinta and Indian Wells, right? Yeah. yeah, both sides of that little mountain. Okay, well, so we need to take action here to to get this moving. On. I'll move the item. Yeah, I'll second. Motion a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Pass five zero. Thank you, David. Thank you, John. Hi, Carrie. All right, so we're on to 8B. This is the uh, SB 1087 yes. okay. related resolution. Good morning. So um, this board item has to do with uh, adopting a resolution in accordance with Senate Bill 1087, which became effective in January 2006. Um, and government code section 65589.7 and water code section 1063. It uh, requires that every five years public agencies um, adapt, adapt, sorry, update and adopt um, written policies and procedures for providing priority service to lower income housing projects. So um, included in the board packet is the resolution. I didn't want to just read it to you, but I'm happy to answer any questions. <coughs> and or summarize it if you'd like. Thank you. And I'll note also that we did receive a written comment on this item, which I believe copies of that are on the dice for each everybody. And <clears throat> so that, that was my comment was on the on the comments we received, whether I'm trying to look at the what's on the agenda here and I'm I'm, I'm just not well since you're on on the podium, did, did we take some of those comments or? I, no, we got these mm -hmm. this comment letter um, like five o'clock yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did review it, um, and I I think that the resolution as is um, is 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 appropriate. Um, I, some of these comments are somewhat specific to working with the county. And I think it goes a little beyond what's required of this resolution. I think we've demonstrated that we have a good partnership mm -hmm. with the county and other agencies, especially through our disadvantaged community infrastructure task force. And um, the county's an active participant in those meetings. And uh, so I, I, I would recommend that we stick with the resolution as is. Okay, there was, um, I, I did uh, read it yesterday and I was uh, trying to get a sense if like anything popped out and one of the things that, and you might be right, we might already be achieving some of what they're proposing, but just for the record, one of the things that popped out at me was this mechanism of, um, of allowing us to be aware of proposed developments and so I think that requires communication with the county right I think there were some comments made here about uh, uh, the specifics of it I, there's somewhere in here where you, you write it says uh, commit to regular communications with the county on the on the existence and status of any development applications that include affordable housing units the district shall request that the county proactively inform the district of applications of which they are aware and so I know we've <clears throat> I know we've tried to tackle that in the past uh, for purposes of, of um, right making and, sure that we make that we make improvements on our on our system right. to be able to of, uh, offer service. Um, I know that we've tried to do that on the idea of the two on twos. I know we keep record of all the proposed developments that that right. we have for all the cities for the county. Some of those are you know lingering for years and now we're trying to take them off if they're not real um but i also know that that we've had a an issue for example in the mecca area for where for a long time we just kind of bumped into issues that constrain development specifically for affordable housing and so if you believe that that we're already doing that without having to embed that language into this then that's really where I'm trying to I'm trying to figure yeah. out. You know, do you feel like we're doing that already? I, I think we are already doing that, and I just don't know how appropriate it is to bind another agency in SCBWD resolution without having a separate agreement on the side. Uh, yeah, and I agree with that. I was going to ask, you know, 
did the county already approve of similar no. resolution? Yeah. Does that and so that was you're right. I, I kind of I feel the same way. Um, and then just one last thing is, what were what are your thoughts on on the comment? Um, I was trying to get a sense of why this comment was made, but there was this last comment made about providing a letter um, within 30 days if a project was denied. What, what do you do? You do you have a sense of what what the comments here are meant for? What are they trying to do with that? I don't, I don't know, um, because I don't know of an instance right now where we deny service. Um, we have what we call a development review letter that we prepare for every applicant that wants water service from us, and we outline the conditions to provide them service. And so, um, that's right. I don't know where this is coming from. Yeah, okay, no, and I think that's good to mention that, uh, that that's our process, that we don't deny service, we simply say, here are the things that are required to, to happen for, for us to provide service, so then it becomes incumbent on the project to develop that infrastructure to provide service, so Correct. I think that's a good answer, thank you. So does SB 1087 come with any funding, right, I mean, it's, it's saying we need to prioritize this, but imagine what's going to be in in this review is, you know, yeah, we'll extend service, but it's going to cost this much, and if somebody doesn't have those funds, it's just not going to happen unless we go out and find grant money, which is what we've been doing, right? To 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 make that happen. We do have a public right. comment on this too. Do we? Yes. Okay. okay. Just maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's. Yeah, but we'll, we'll have board questions. Yeah, I don't know. The, I don't know the answer to that. If that if SB 1097 comes with funding, I, I don't. I would imagine it doesn't. But I imagine it doesn't also. Okay. This isn't putting. I mean, I'm I'm trying to because that's a good question. This isn't saying that the district is using its funding no. to yeah. make improvements. No, no, no. It's, this is more right. of an availability right. issue, right? <clears throat> so. Yes. To the extent that there's availability um, in a particular area, is the intent that, that that availability would be prioritized for affordable housing? Is that the intent yes, of this? Yes, that's mm -hmm. the intent. Okay. I mean, it sounds like something that we're already doing, but now right. it's, now yeah, it's it, codified it's in an ordinance. Now, in yeah. A, a in a resolution, I mean. Right. And, and the original, there was an original, this was taken to the board. There was a resolution that was passed in 2006. Unfortunately, it fell off the radar after that. We are supposed to do it every five years, so. <laughs> okay. Well, there, so it's back on the radar. So it's back on the radar. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So you, we do have public comment? We do, Mr. President. Right. We have Ms. Uh, Lupita Luau. Please come on up. Thank Good morning. You. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> hello, hello. <laughs> My name is Lupita Lua uh, with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. And this resolution presents an opportunity not only to prevent delays when building affordable housing due to the need to extend drinking, drinking water and wastewater services, but also to prioritize this type of housing. Um, however, as currently written, we are concerned that this resolution will unintentionally prioritize luxury developments, um, merely for the inclusion of some minuscule amount of low income housing units. Additionally, we ask that this policy extend to existing affordable housing options like Bolanco Parks and Noble Home Parks throughout the Eastern Coachella Valley. We submitted a common letter um, with suggested edits to the resolution's language that would address these concerns. And we ask the board to continue to work on the resolution's language as it requires refinement and to consider making the changes we suggested in our letter before finalizing the resolution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
that was all I had for my presentation, unless there's any further questions. We do have quite a few attendees on Zoom, so I'll verify that. All right, yeah, check, up, okay. check with other... Um, Sure. Um, so if there is my mic on, yeah. If there's any members of the public on Zoom that would like to speak to this item, please use the raise hand feature at this time, and we'll call on you. You know, I mean, I, I wonder if even that, the idea that luxury developments would be deprioritized, if that's even legal. I don't think it is, because then we'd be violating the state requirement. Yeah, I would only state that this policy says that if there is a need to prioritize, we prioritize low-income housing. What this resolution does is say we're going to implement the requirements of law, for example, the things that were put in that comment letter. So we will be doing the things in that comment letter. We just wouldn't recommend that those particular procedures be put in the resolution. The resolution yeah. says that we need to take these things into account. We do that already. But if there were ever an insufficient amount of water, right. then we would have, have to go through that, uh, through those steps, which we will do and have done. I understand. But I guess my, my thinking there is that if the state's requiring us to prioritize low-income housing, I don't think we would pass a resolution that says, yeah, but certain types of low-income housing, we're not going to do that. Because it sounds like we'd be violating Correct. SB Correct. 1087. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So these are all very good points and comments. I would only say that we do those things as part of implementing the resolution. I just went from a legal point of view think that we need to include that level of detail in the resolution. Itself. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay, thank you. So are we? Are there any other commenters? I'm just checking one last time here. No. Okay. All right. Is there a motion that we might consider? Motion to adopt the resolution. You can't make a motion, Jeff. No, I'm saying that's what the motion would be. <laughs> I was like, go Turn his microphone I on. think you were asking well, what kind of motion I just, just said. Try to move. This um, is the kind of motion. This is the kind of motion. Move along. I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> I'll move, I'll make the motion to approve the uh, resolution uh, as we have described here. I think the input is all good input and um, I know the district has been making a lot of uh, efforts uh, in these areas, especially with the Disadvantaged Community Task Force and uh, um, and I, so I'll, I'll make that motion. Thank you. I'll second. Okay, good. Is there any other discussion before we vote? Hearing none, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passed by well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments also. <sighs> C. This is the PSA with WSB. David again. Good morning. Good yeah. morning again. The purpose of this item is to authorize the general manager to execute a professional services agreement with WSP. In the amount of $484,841 for the Thousand Palms Flood Control Project, the cost includes uh, CBWD project management and Riverside County Flood Control structural engineering plan review and a project contingency. The total cost of this request is $624,841. Uh, the Thousand Palms Flood Control Project, as you know, is intended to capture the flood hazards emanating from multiple watersheds uh, through the Thousand Palms area, as is shown on the exhibit. Um, here, it captures the flows upstream, conveys them through the existing storm channels within the Classic Club, runs them along Avenue 38, and discharges them into the existing flood control channel within, or channels within Sun City Palm Desert, which with the North Indio Flood Control Project and the improvements we'll be making to the Thousand Palms Channel downstream will allow for these flows to ultimately be conveyed into the Coachella Valley Stormwater Channel. Uh, the scope before you is just to bring the plans uh, up to construction ready and to phase them out. Uh, the idea being that we can phase this, put this into three phases and bring the project um, to the community sooner 
than we would otherwise if we were waiting for the uh, funds available for the entire project. It's about a $100 million project is the estimated uh, cost. And so the idea here is to phase it out and make it more um, uh, feasible for funding and, and those sorts of things and align it with our own funding capacity. I'll take any questions. David, I guess I'm, um, I guess my thought on this is um, we, you know, this has been on the books for a long time. Uh, we ended up doing some further work down in Indio, just south of the, um, um, of the Pulte homes there um, to be able to take these uh, flows and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and so now we're coming back to this is um, where, where we stand in the flood control uh, finance part of it. And I know that's, that's not a question that you can answer today, but I, I guess, you know, my, my interest would be, hey, we just put a, a $130 million in uh, through that North Indio area. Um, how do we stand on finances to be able to phase this in in the three phases, maybe 30 million bucks a piece? Maybe you have an idea on that, but. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to speak for finance, but in general, we, we are short on funds for the project, which is the impetus for phasing it. Mm -hmm. to see if we can make um, it more palatable, if you will. Yeah. Um, but that's that's the driver for this, and we're looking at other alternative means for getting the funding. Yeah. No, it's good. I, you know, it's it's tax, it's property tax-based, and, right. you know, that, that will go up with assessed values go up. But, um, you know, just trying to get an idea, Jim, and mm -hmm. how, uh, in the future, how this would be implementable in uh, even in the is phase approach, uh, what kind of time frame we might be looking at and what other funds we might want to go seek in the interim? Yeah, so um, I can't answer that question directly, but there is a real limitation based on the revenue uh, that we receive sure. as to how much debt we can actually take on. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, pursued loans. Um, we are pursuing a grant now with the county for what would be considered reach four, which is basically the taking the flows that come out of the classic club uh, and sending them east into uh, Sun City, a Thousand Palms golf course, mm -hmm. and uh, basically removing and reconstructing uh, Avenue 38. Um, and so I don't know how competitive that project will be. Uh, it's not the only project being submitted by Coachella Valley um, to the Department of Transportation, but because we don't own uh, transportation assets, uh, there is a value in partnering with the county. Uh, and, but that uh, app is due uh, Thursday of this week. So um, there are a couple of folks running around with their hair on fire now uh, at the county. Um, we're providing uh, the design that we've pretty much already got in the construction estimate, although there is an alternative that the Berger Foundation is attempting to pursue that we are not supportive of at this time. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, what is the timing on the three phases? Is this like a five, a five-year, ten-year? Well, right now we're working on land acquisition. We expect that to be a two or three, two or three year project. Just for acquisition. Just for land acquisition. So I think I would be optimistic if, if I said we could put this out to bid um, in year four. We're probably looking at year five, assuming we have the funding. And then maybe for a, the couple, phase one. a couple of years for each phase. Right. So 10, 12 years mm -hmm. to get phase three done. Okay. So, so, so who's the. Uh, Who's the agency with the big pot of money out there for, for flood control? Is it FEMA or at the federal level? Uh, there's all sorts of federal monies, but everybody's competing for it, too. Yeah, so the loan we got was a WIFIA yes. loan, uh, which I, I guess the funding agency for that is EPA. Is that That's right? That's correct, yes. And uh, payback. Yeah, you know, it's to, a loan. Yeah, it's a loan, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big difference. A low interest loan. Yes. Yeah. But still, yeah. To, to the comment that was made, uh, I think it was Director Aguilar about like, just getting together with some of the other agencies to maybe get at this from a more regional standpoint with some of the cities, some of the other government agencies. It sounds like we're already doing that with the county, but 
to the extent that we can build a coalition to tackle some of these kind of regional issues, I think would be beneficial. We might be doing that already. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking about like CVAG. I'm thinking about individual cities. Um, I understand. Um, you know, we, we have had a number of discussions uh, with Cathedral City and Palm Desert and La Quinta, um, primarily because of the storm we all just experienced. And um, we met with Palm Desert yesterday, who's interested in looking at uh, local drainage air issues, um, basically south of I-10 and south of the railroad, um, specifically in an area that was once um, looked at as the Mid Valley um, stormwater channel. Uh, the district was involved in looking at that, uh, kind of facilitating uh, a design to look at those parcels all along that area, um, which are city responsibilities. Uh, unfortunately, um, the program, the project was deprogrammed back in 2012 because the return on investment. Um, just didn't work. It was uh, hugely expensive, and the cities decided not to participate. So we just took it off the books. But there are, you know, so we look at regional issues, but there are a number of local <coughs> drainage issues that we really, you know, there's not enough money for us to participate in both. Sure, and what I meant by my comment was that, you know, a project like this, we're looking at it as regional, and it has a million dollar price tag. 100 million yeah and so um, maybe there's some benefit to trying to secure funding so that it doesn't take us 20 years to complete with our just our own financing which is very limited and so I, I you know someone has money out there but you're right it's competitive and and we do have regular meetings uh, with, with we have a consultant on board that's helping to try to locate where we can get funding where it's available and seeing where we can qualify Okay. Thank you. Yeah. When when you went through the proposal, we went through this for the whole valley, and your number for the whole valley was over a billion dollars, wasn't it, at one time? Yes. Okay. Over two billion. Two billion. Or two billion. What was that this project included in that two billion dollars? Yes. Okay. It's just back then I believe when you did it was six or seven years ago, the costs were probably cheaper. Cheaper. <laughs> a lot cheaper. We, were, we may be three or four billion. Yeah. So the reality is, is the, yeah. the the desert is growing faster than, than, than what we can, we could put up, and and we have limited funds, and there's a cap on those funds on how much we can get per year, and that's it, no matter what, until we figure out a way to change that. Um, yeah, that, and that's a struggle that we're going to be struggling with for for a while to try and figure out because, you know, that number was, I think it was six or seven years ago. Two billion dollars, and now it's probably, without exaggeration, probably three, three plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that doesn't so, include yeah. a lot of the eastern control well, no. valley who has zero and that, flood control. And I mean, when was, I say zero, they yeah. have zero flood control. There, there is nothing. Mm -hmm. So I mean, these are add-on projects in the all over the Coachella Valley, which which we need. But you know, sooner or later, there's going to be some need in some cities that have zero. Yeah, there's a need for some, I imagine, regional protection coming from the mountains on the east side, mm -hmm. whether it's the, the Oasis Slope or the other side. Both sides. And so... Um, we do have master plans for those yeah. locations. Yeah. We, yeah. And we'll talk we're, about we're this. Those. And we will. Yes. So it's coming up. You're going to yeah. have an update on that. On the ne stormwater next meeting. division, yeah. Ready. We want to catch as many board members as we can as well. So if for some reason folks are not able to attend um, the next meeting, which I guess is the evening meeting, um, we'll, we'll, we'll find a time that works. Good. Well, all right. What is I, the I'm sorry, John. Uh, yeah. So, David will the, or, and Jim, the report that we're going to be getting next meeting regarding uh, the master plan work, will that include a discussion around financial resources and uh, financial options or just a capital presentation? Uh, right now, I think it's just the capital presentation from an engineering perspective. So, it'd probably be pretty easy to put a financial component on that. Yeah, I can talk to Rick. He's. Out. I mean, it's not like there's a. It's not a complicated question. But David's here. David can. David Lacey can we take have notes. Very limited, you know, sources of, of funding for that. So we know what it is. Yeah, yeah. it's not going to be that hard. 
what we don't know is what funding opportunities are there that will consume the revenue faster, depending yeah, on the interest no, rate. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I just think that the, the, um, the federal government agenda particularly is so, um, you know, it's just so weird right now because there are pots of money that have been approved that haven't been allocated. I know, you know, Victoria, you guys are all over this, but I think um, maybe more of a focused attention on what's there that hasn't moved but could be moved is something that uh, our lobbyists particularly should be spending more time on. We also have to balance staff resourcing and what we're able to manage. It's difficult now to hire engineers. We've got quite a few vacancies um, that have been open for quite some time. Um, and hiring consultants isn't the solution because then you've got to manage the consultants. Um, but, you know, there's, there's things that come into how quickly we can move. It's not just financing. It's not just design. It's how much of a workload can we take on as we're also trying to manage other initiatives in other parts of the district. You know, I, I get it. I hear you. All right, we look forward to that information at the next meeting. All right, and now back to this one. Is there a motion to approve HC? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Yeah, the second. Um, good. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passed 5 0. Thank you. Thanks, David. David. Finance. So David, what's that revenue plan look like for that stormwater? <laughs> you can you can whip that up quickly. Well, I could give you a few quick stats since I have my laptop open, <laughs> but just wanted to we talked about interest rate on the Whitfield loan. So um, that was at 1.9. We had issued basically that loan was for 59 million. We also did issue an additional 53 million in debt with a true interest cost of about 3.85. So about 113 million that we already have in the stormwater fund. And our coverage, at least as of FY24, debt service coverage is about 2.9%. So it gives us an idea of meeting our minimum coverage of about 1.25. We have some room, but that is part of what we discussed with the board during the budget presentations of doing that authorizing resolution of about another 30 million is what we're looking at, at least um, as of those discussions. But we can provide more information as that comes. Wow, but, I'm impressed. That's very good. good Thanks, answer. I am but, very impressed. <laughs> anyway, uh, th this one's yeah. very quick, so yeah, apologize. Uh, so uh, in Rick's absence, I'll just go ahead and speak to this one. Um, we regularly meet with um, our uh, on-call grant consultants, Woodard and Kern, and um, also with the State Water Resource Control Board staff. Um, as they were reviewing this uh, resolution, which the board adopted back in September um, 22, they um, noticed that we'd had a more general um, project title to this. So they had requested us to have the more specific title that's listed in your report, which I'll pull up really quick because I'm trying yeah. to remember what the difference was. But um, we had it listed originally as the uh, East Coachella Valley Planning Project, and they were requesting us to change that title to what was in the CEQA review and things as well. So it's now called the East Coachella Valley mm -hmm. Water Supply Project Update and Consolidation Planning Project. So in order to uh, continue to make this process move forward, uh, they were asked us to make that change and readopt that authorizing resolution to keep the application moving. Yeah, we're not going to have an acronym for that one. <laughs> ECVWSPUCPP. <laughs> well, I always think of finance as an internal service uh, department, but this is, I think, our way of being an external service department, so we're trying to be responsive to the request from the agency. Thank you. David. Of course. Is there a motion to approve this? Okay. I'll make a motion, but I did have a question. Oh, go ahead. I, I, so just to be clear, this is just a name change? It's a name change, yeah. Uh, the red line is the attachment to, so you can see what we changed in the original one, but that was really what they were requesting in that piece of it. So okay. generally when we're going out for these, for those applications, uh, you know, those project titles may change a little bit. I think um, they were more concerned about, this, the, I guess, identifying the two components of what this truly is, and so that was more, it, yeah. they wanted to go through and make sure that this matches through all the documentation that was there. But it's not changing the, the project scope in any of that? No, no, no change in scope. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Nelson, second. Uh, all in favor, say oh. aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. <laughs> That's fine. Good. Oh, Thank yes. you. Good, good, good job. Thanks. Um, great. Yeah. Good presentation. Got more than we bargained for there. <laughs> but at the same time, less somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it's an elegant presentation. Fast and inform information packed. All right. On to E. Hi. Right, good morning. Good morning. So this uh, BAI is for authorization to purchase directors and officers liability insurance for the period of September 29th, 2023 through September 28th, 2024, not 29 as it says right there. Um, and the amount is for $702,000. Um, however, last week you just did come back and tell us that they're willing to um, do a short-term policy so that we're back on track with the the other policies to renew in July 1st. So the actual amount will be for 529,125. Any questions? Okay. This is to the save our bacon uh, <laughs> uh, insurance policy, Jeff. Uh, it it yes. is, an, yeah. And I believe we could, you would still recommend up to 702 mm -hmm. in case the 500 numbers changes a little bit. This is up to, but this is what hopefully it will be. Correct. And this covers all decision makers in the organization? Directors and officers, managers. So would you be covered, Blanca? Yes. I will. I'll make a motion. Second. Yeah, thank you, Blanca. Thank you. Motion and a second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Passed again 5 0. Thanks, Blanca. <sighs> Let's see here. Last one. Huh, Dan Charles, it must be important. It is not. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> So this uh, item is to authorize uh, NDI and a professional services agreement uh, to continue on with our telemetry upgrade project, phase two. So as you all know, we have the skater master plan in place. We have a new backbone system that'll take us into the next generation. Uh, it's a, called Aviva. Uh, NDI has been our primary expert consultant for the last five, six years on the implementation of the background support or software for that implementation. Um, but that being said, now we need to take um, that backbone and spread it throughout the company. We have 169 sites with um, very antiquated uh, equipment as far as eyes in the field that can actually communicate with this very elaborate system that we have. Um, we, last year we bought 51 uh, new PLCs NDI actually got the bid to be able to construct those. And now we are taking uh, the PLCs. We have to put our inputs and outputs in for each of the various sites. Uh, they will help us do the HMI programming, which is the human machine interface, some of the other de design development in the background to be able to bring back additional information to the company. Um, in addition to that, they are going to work on a roadmap, and the roadmap will tell us how we get the remaining 118 sites online, how we prioritize, um, look for synergies, but just basically develop a sequencing plan uh, for all of these sites. Um, it, it's going to be uh, very elaborate um, to be able to uh, bring all these back to the company. It's going to provide significant labor savings instantaneous information on our well sites, boosters, lift stations. If you can imagine, we have lift stations where there's a new category four spill of 50 gallons or less, and we have 35-year-old equipment that is, is our eyes in the fields, and we had to communicate a middleware or basically develop a program to even be able to talk with this very elaborate, massive backbone that we have from the SCADA master plant. So long story longer, they're going to come in, they're going to write the software for this for the, what I would call site-specific, wells, boosters, lift stations, and the such. They are going to develop a sequencing plan and prioritization plan through workshops with our team. They are going to transfer the knowledge base, um, meaning 
we have to find a line in the sand. We, we, we had a monopoly, Saipar had a monopoly. Mm -hmm. So we have to find that line in the sand of what they truly should be doing long term and how to transfer as much information as possible to our teams to be able to use the software and to be able to implement what we need to do on a specific level. Um, so that's, that's kind of the whole roadmap uh, construct of this. So we have the 400,000 uh, in the Skater Master Plan budget. So I'm stealing Luis's money and we are hoping to get this approved. I think it's extremely important um, to be able to transfer this extensive program to our individual sites to be able to bring back more information. It's going to save us a lot of money long term. So yeah. with that, I would open okay. it up to any questions. Yes, yeah, so these 162 sites, um, it might have been in the, the write-up, but I, I missed it. Uh, eventually, we're going to be buying new hardware for these 162 mm -hmm. sites. Yeah. So, so what, what's the schedule for that, and what, what, do you, what generally is that going to cost? Well, that's a great question. Um, we, um, so we bought 51 of them already, the hardware, and we, uh, part of this project is to develop the supporting software to run the hardware and, and then to educate our staff on what we should be able to do and what they are able to do. So we have 51. We are in the process of putting inputs and outputs, and upon hiring of them, they will review what we're doing. They will make sure the sequencing's right. They'll make sure the software support is right. And then once we get this 400,000 going, we intend on, you know, developing along with the roadmap, a program of getting the other 118 that are left to do. Um, they gave us an amazing price. We were shocked that they gave us a price of, I think, 738,000 for 51 PLCs, which was amazing. So as we get more sophisticated uh, and understand the Aviva system, um, and we communicate closely with this team, I think we'll be able to continue on. It'll probably be three more launches of 40-ish, of 35 to 40-ish. So, okay. But it's, I mean, it, it's paramount, and it, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, primarily in domestic and sanitation, we have all the plants, the, the large plants are in really good shape instrumentation-wise, but our lift stations are, are not. Um, so this phase one is actually handling that, the 51 that we're doing, 13 of them are specifically for lift stations, and then most of it is primarily domestic. Reservoirs, boosters, well sites, way more information we're gonna be able to get yeah. immediately 24 7 so you hit the most critical ones first mm -hmm. yeah. yeah we've prioritized the 51 that we have now and we have a master plan of what is remaining and then we'll work with this consultant to be able to you know prioritize the additional 118. thank you i'll make a motion <clears throat> to approve is there a second? I'll second. All right. The SCADA master plan is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> never, Since 2017. It, it'll never end. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. It's like, oh, we have this to connect. Oh, <laughs> yeah. we have that to connect. Well, we had a 50-year-old system that was antiquated. We couldn't even use it anymore. So this is for the next 30 to 40 years, this yeah, system. Yeah, I believe so. it. So are you going to be able to connect up to the blood pressure of Jim Barrett so we can watch it uh, go across the screen when we ask uh, pertinent questions? As long as it doesn't look at my blood pressure, I'm fine. <laughs> but, no, but like yes, pH levels, flow, in for, like things that we've never been able to capture. I think it's data, data is power, and be, to be able to mine that data is paramount. So Yeah, no, just to be able to manage, right? Good. All right. So there is a motion and a second to approve this item. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. It's 5 0. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Dan. Dan. <sighs> Written communications. We did have uh, three items that were indicated on the packet. A couple right. of them pending. We, we one distributed of them a revised um, handout this morning. So. Right. With the three items. Yeah. Got it. There's an information presentation um, which is going to be handled by Carla. Carla. Me. On the Good. investments. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Good morning, board members. Uh, on Zoom, we have two consultants, one from Chandler. It should be um, Alan Clark. Uh, sorry, Alan Clark is from OPEB, from PFM, and then um, 
Ellen Sampson from Chandler. So they will be giving the, the presentation itself. Uh, the presentation is intended to go over the six months from January uh, 2023 to June 30th of 2023, very high level. And if uh, the presentation works for the board, our intent is to continue to bring these uh, consultants back every six months uh, to give a similar presentation to the board members. So if you can keep that in mind and maybe get some feedback at the end if six that would months. work for you. Right. So we'll start off with um, Chandler Investments. Okay. Hi, good morning. Are you able to hear me? Yes. 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 Perfect. And shall I share my screen or are you able to see the presentation already? Uh, we have the presentation on the screen. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, good morning again and thank you for having me. My name is Elaine Marie Sampson. I am a senior portfolio strategist at Chandler Asset Management. Um, we are the investment advisor for the district for the operating reserve. I'll give a brief economic update and portfolio review as is stated, and I'll pause between um, each section for questions. So if we can move forward to slide four, please. And I can't see the, the slides, so I'm just letting you know that I, I'm not able to see them. So you know, the if you give headline, us, sorry, if you give us a minute, what we'll do is we'll put the PowerPoint up and then we'll do a picture in picture. So staff is listening to me as I'm saying that, and they'll work on that, and that way we can, you can see the PowerPoint and then we'll have your photo down yeah. below. Can, can, oh, can we get a little more volume on the yeah. audio, please? Thank you. And I will also try to speak up a bit if that helps. Okay. Uh, so I will continue on. So the very big headline is that the Federal Reserve has been seeking to slow growth and not have a deep recession, which you'll hear on the news called a soft landing. And they're doing this by raising interest rates to temper inflation. For much of this year, it has been solid labor markets and the resilient consumer that have been pointing us to being different this time with regards to the recession debates. However, there are weakening economic signs, and it is the view of Chandler Asset Management that the Federal Reserve is near a pause and will maintain these higher rates for some time. If we could move forward to the next slide, I can talk to you about what those labor conditions look like. So the recent trends in the labor market have been strong, as you can tell from the left-hand side, um, from non-farm payables, but cooling. The overall employment rose by 187,000 jobs in August. And on the right-hand side, you can see that unemployment rose by 0.3 percentage points to 3.8% in August, as more workers came back to the workforce. Although this is a slight rise, I'd note that this is below the pre-pandemic levels and below structural unemployment. This is part of what's been giving the Federal Reserve the, the confidence in it being able to raise interest rates. There in Riverside, I'd point to the the unemployment is a little bit higher at 5%, but this is partially attributable to your county having a higher labor force participation rate. If we can move forward two slides to inflation, please. The Federal Reserve has continued to raise interest rates because although the inflationary pressures have certainly been easing from that 9% peak you can see on the left-hand side since uh, July of 2022, headline is now at about 3.2% core inflation has remained elevated. The persistently core inflation has made the Federal Reserve project interest rates to be higher for longer. And I'll point you to the right-hand side, the personal consumption's expenditure. This is the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation, and specifically, it's the dotted four line that they look at. And that number has remained around 4% for some time, and they'd like to see it at that orange 2% line. Um, overall, I would point to... Um, this is an area that they've been concerned about because in the 1970s, they cut rates very quickly and were blamed for not dealing with inflation appropriately. They don't want to have a similar policy error. If we can move forward to consumer, to the next slide. The consumers, we represent two thirds of GDP in the United States. We are a nation of shoppers. This is evident by the strong retail sales that are persisting in the third quarter, evidenced by uh, what you can see there on the left-hand side, although that is a much smaller place than what you see uh, in 2021, which is a reversal of COVID situation. That is still a, a pretty strong sign. But we do see headwinds coming in October with student loan repayments starting after three years of being in forbearance. We're anticipating that to be about $300 a month, which would be a 5% hit to in median incomes for those who have um, those student loans. And if we can move forward, this is a very quickly moving forward to the Federal Reserve slide, which is number 13, please. 
this, as I stated, the strength of the labor market and the consumer have allowed the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates another 25 basis points. I think you're about two more slides forward, please. One, two, one more. There we are. Thank you. Um, and so you can see on the right hand side, the interest rates rose another 25 basis points in July uh, to the range of 5.25 to 5.5 percent. That's the highest level we've seen in 22 years. The Federal Reserve paused last week, but they did leave the option open to raise interest rates yet again in this last quarter of the year. The market has now priced in higher for longer, with yields now above the start of the year and even higher after this most recent Federal Reserve meeting. If we can move to the final slide for the economy, bond yields is the next one. Just want to point to on the left-hand side, you can see that there's been a lot of volatility in that left-hand chart. Um, this heartbeat pattern has been quite the dip and recovery multiple times this year. Um, but for those portfolios that are staying to discipline to strategy, these have really created good moments to invest at higher yields. On the right hand side, I would point us to the fact that the yield curve has been inverted since last year. And this is notable because that yield curve and inversion where longer term yields are lower than shorter term yields. This has been a strong predictor of recession in the past. So I'll pause here for questions before turning to the portfolio. Any questions? Yeah, so what, here's a question. So what, uh, what type of information would, would, would precipitate uh, um, a, a flipping of that inverted curve? Uh, so a couple of things where they, the curve is currently inverted because the market anticipates the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates. So if the Federal Reserve were to reverse course and say, you know, inflation starts roaring back and we have to start uh, raising interest rates even further, we would see short term rates go a little bit higher. Um, I think we're now at a point, though, where really it's going to be time. Uh, and what I mean by that is we, we see currently our overall interest rate is higher than what we would anticipate it to be in the long run. Our anticipation of where rates would be in the long run would be about three and a half, four percent. And so it will take that time for interest rates to come back down. So as the Federal Reserve starts to cut interest rates, which we anticipate to be in the, la in the mid part of 2024, we would see the short term interest rates start to come down and therefore the longer term interest rates start to rise back up. Sorry, I, I said that in two different ways. No, that's that's helpful. Thank you. John, I have a question. I just have a quick question. Um, does the, uh, the, the impending uh, government shutdown, since we have most of our money in government securities, does that have any impact or relationship to our returns? Um, it, it's very different than the debt ceiling debate. Uh, so the debt ceiling debate, and I'm going to bring that as the example, really pointed us to the U.S. government's willingness to pay its debt. And so that had a very big impact on overall returns um, for the marketplace that what we saw earlier this year. This, in contrast with the government shutdown, has more to do with the government's um, a willingness to pay our military, uh, various government programs. And typically, after that furlough has happened, there will be back payments. So in terms of the debt, there's not a lot of impact that will happen there. But there is just a lot of general disruption to the government and then questions about our, our government's ability to, to take care of business, if you will. OK, thank you. Okay, uh, so I will continue forward on slide 16, please. That's uh, about two slides forward. So our, our focus for the benchmark is, or for the portfolio is first and foremost to be focused on safety and liquidity and then earning a, a rate of return commensurate with your benchmark. We can move forward to the next slide, compliance. The portfolio is in compliance with both state code and the most recent investment policy. As a reminder, we could start investing in longer dated securities beginning in June. This was something that the board approved. And we will keep uh, investing in those long, longer dated securities. We're going to focus only on U.S. Treasuries and agencies, although municipal securities are also um, approved to be invested in. Our goal is to lock in some of these higher for longer yields before we start seeing those interest rates turn around to the earlier question about a seeing that reversal of the, the yield curve. We move forward to slide 18. 
the portfolio characteristics. This gives you a snapshot of what your portfolio has looked like in the last six months. You will see on the second line, your modified duration is slightly shorter than the benchmark. And this has been intentional as part of our barbell strategy of investing to really capture some of those short-term high yields, but also locking in the longer-term high yields. The purchase yields of the portfolio, this is the average purchase yield of the securities at time of purchase, has continued to increase. You can see that has moved up from one 0.4% in December to 1.95%. And simultaneously, the market yields have increased quite a bit by 49 basis points. That one basis point is one one hundredth of a percent. And as you saw in the earlier bond yields, that has been quite a bumpy ride for us to get there for these market yields to get to the 5.71%. Well, now, despite there being an inverse relationship between market yield and market value, um, the market value did increase in this portfolio from $424 million to $430 million, and it was supported by higher accrued interest. I, it's not on the page, but I was just really excited to see that in the over the course of the fiscal year, the monthly income for this portfolio has increased from $322,000 to $685,000 a month. Um, so over a 100% increase over the course of the year. Now, the very last line on this page, you can see that the total realized income for this portfolio did double, um, and that was supported by an added $50 million into the portfolio, again, in this rising rate environment. And all of this happening on a high quality portfolio. I'm going to skip a couple of slides and go to 21. Um, can, a duration can, I, can, slide. I stop, oh, can, can I stop please. you there? Can you put that one back on? I, I just. For, for this for a simple look at this right for, yeah for one month I mean if you took the the value of the portfolio at 431 million right and then you took the average market yield of 5.17 percent right that comes to 22 mm -hmm. million and then you divide by 12. That gets you to 1.8 million, but you said the monthly return was 600,000. Yes. So, how, so, what's the difference? The difference is uh, focusing on market yield. That is the, the yield of the portfolio if you were to buy the entire portfolio as of June 30th. What your portfolio is yielding is the, actually the purchase yield number, the 1.95%. And that is an average of all of the securities in the portfolio, which would include securities that were purchased in 2020, around when interest rates were much closer to that zero bound range, as well as securities that we've been purchasing more recently, which are much closer to that market yield of 5.17%. So it's an amalgamation of all of the securities in the portfolio with the average purchase yield. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Um, so continuing forward with the duration slide on 21, there's two pieces here. I, I skipped forward two slides just because um, it provides the same information, just with different charts. At the top of the page, you can see that this is a well-diversified portfolio um, in terms of the kinds of securities that we are invested in. And I want to point us to the lower half of the portfolio to just really highlight a couple of things that may stand out. The first being in June of 2022, the last day of the fiscal year, that's when the $50 million was contributed to the portfolio. So we were short duration on that particular reporting day. We have since invested those proceeds and are benefiting from um, having been able to invest um, in the higher short-term interest rates. And now that the seasoning period has passed with regards to um, that approval for us to invest up to a 10-year U.S. Treasury and agencies, we have begun um, purchasing seven-year treasuries. We actually did that for the first time in the month of August and intend to start doing that to help move this portfolio closer to target. Uh, we have been short, as I mentioned, uh, because we wanted to capture some of the shorter term interest rates, but because we believe the Federal Reserve is near pause, we believe it is now time to bring the portfolio's overall duration closer to the benchmark. We can move forward to the issuer slide. I'll just note here that you'll see the top issuers are primarily U.S. Treasury and agencies, and this is for safety and liquidity. For the rest of the, the page, you can see that we'd like to keep our corporate issuers less than 2% of the portfolio, and this increases the diversification and is much below the 5% limit uh, set by state code and your policy. And finally, um, we'll go to investment performance. 
one more, there we are. Uh, and this is the total return. It has two components, the interest component and the underlying price changes. That includes unrealized gains and losses. And positively, the headline is that the portfolio has outperformed the benchmark. This is a publicly available benchmark across all time periods. And we're doing well because of that credit exposure. That includes the asset backed securities and the collateralized mortgage obligations and as I mentioned, being short in this rising interest rate environment. Specifically, I'll point to that three month period. Um, we saw the quick uh, down grade of some of the, the financial, the regional banks. This caused the benchmark to have negative returns in that three month period compared to the bank the portfolio's 0% uh, total return, outperforming by 45 basis points. On a full year, that 12-month basis, you can see that we outperformed by 67 basis points. And since inception, there has been a 24 basis point outperformance. Our goal alongside of the district has been to really focus on having a sleep at night portfolio so you can feel like you're in good hands with seeing this head in the right direction. So I'll stop there given time. We're good. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. And then up next, we have Alan with PFM uh, to go over the OPEB Trust. And I believe this is going to be Alan's last presentation with the board. She is retiring. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. Alan, you're muted, but we're, we're ready when you are. We can't hear you. Hi, Alan, we can't hear you. Can you double check your audio? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry go. about that. You would think after several years that we'd have this down, but uh, <laughs> it's always a little bit different depending upon what system you're on. That's correct. So good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through the market um, overview as you've just heard a very good overview, but. The OPEB Trust is not just invested in fixed income assets, it's also invested in equity assets, and those equity assets are represented by not only U.S. companies, but international companies. So if we could go to page one, um, the market index performance here shows you that we've had a very strong uh, U.S. and international uh, equity market performance through the first six months of 2023. Um, we have had a bit of a pullback in the equity markets here, really, in the month of September. Um, but you see that year-to-date number on the Russell 3000 index, the last one at that top, uh, at 16.7%. So extremely strong performance. And that strong performance, despite the negative returns that we saw in 2022, you see that one, three, and five year numbers are extremely strong as well. Um, those numbers, as I said, have pulled back just a bit. So if I take you through uh, Friday of last week, the year to date number is now down to about 13.5%. International stocks haven't fared quite as well as domestic stocks. We use that MSCI AC World XUSA, which is all developed and emerging markets. On a year-to-date basis, 9.5% uh, through 6.30. Uh, through last Friday, that's down to about 5.8%. So we have seen a pullback there as well. Um, we don't have currently any alternatives in the portfolio. We do show you there uh, our REIT index as well as a commodities index. And what you see on the commodities side is a lot of volatility if you look uh, at the year-to-date one-year number and look out to the three- and five-year numbers, 
we did in the past have an allocation to commodities as an inflation hedge, but have redeployed that money into domestic and international stocks uh, over the last 12 months and eliminated that position. On the fixed income side, we use that Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Index as our benchmark. Um, positive return on a year-to-date basis as of 6.30, positive 2.1%. Um, but as Ms. Sampson has said, we've continued to see interest rates rise. Uh, and as we expect interest rates to be higher for longer, we've seen a pullback in the, in the fixed income market return. And that number on a year-to-date basis, again, through last Friday, is about negative 1%. So let's, let's look at how this translates to your portfolio uh, and um, the portfolio that's invested for the OPEB Trust on the next page. Um, the next page shows you not only the performance, but the asset allocation of the portfolio. This portfolio has a target asset allocation of 60% in stock, uh, stock divided between uh, you know, 39% in domestic equity and 21% in international equity, and the other 40% of the portfolio is in fixed income. On a year-to-date basis, a positive 8.5% uh, return on the portfolio, trailing the benchmark just a little bit at 9%. But if you look out to the three, five, and since inception returns there, you've got um, close to a six or an exceeding a 6% annualized rate of return, and that being well ahead of the benchmark as, as shown. Uh, the tactical asset allocation of the portfolio currently is at target. Uh, you can see we are varying very, very slightly. Uh, if anything, we've seen uh, domestic equity stocks do a bit better than international and fixed income. So any um, overweight to domestic equity is really because of a market performance uh, uh, attribution than it is um, any kind of uh, 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 overweight on our part. I'd like to go through um, the next page of some of the things that we've done to the portfolio or how we've adjusted the portfolio over the last six months and then ask, answer any questions. Uh, so the, one of the primary reasons for underperformance of the portfolio since the beginning of the year is that we started off the year very strong in both the um, U.S. large cap and small cap stocks. Small cap stocks were less expensive than large cap stocks, and our viewpoint was that small cap stocks was, were going to outperform large on a going forward basis. We took a slight overweight to small and mid cap stocks at the end of February. And then uh, all heck broke loose in the market um, with the demise of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank at the first, that first week of March. Um, because we're fundamental investors and looking at uh, the, the value of the securities that we're buying, we did hold that position. Uh, and we hold, held that position in through um, and to uh, May of 2023. But uh, investor sentiment was not with us on that. Uh, the rocking of the, that mid-cap or that uh, mid-market uh, banking sector uh, gave pause for investors, and we really didn't see the returns bounce back in small mid-cap stocks. And so we removed that uh, allocation in May of 2023, but that um, was after the damage that we experienced having had that slight overweight. The domestic equity market has been dominated by about a half a dozen large technology stocks. It has not been a very broad market from a performance standpoint. Uh, in the last month, we've seen uh, stocks pull back fairly significantly. You, you saw earlier um, my comments on a year-to-date basis. Um, we've given up something in the neighborhood of 25 to 3%, and most of that has happened in the last three weeks. Uh, that really is uh, reflecting investor concerns, uh, concerns uh, Ms. Sampson talked about the uh, consumer being two-thirds to three-quarters of the U.S. economy, and the consumer is, is faltering a bit. 
Uh, we are looking at earning estimates cuts that have come in the last couple of weeks. So uh, despite the fact that we're going to see GDP growth being a bit stronger than what the Fed projected at the beginning of the year, uh, it is slower growth, something in the 25 to 3% range. Uh, and we are looking for interest rates to be higher for longer. Uh, since uh, in the third quarter of this year, we increased our allocation to international small cap. We see that as an area of opportunity. And we've added to emerging markets, but we've added to emerging markets ex-China. China's the largest economy in the emerging market world, and their uh, economy has been faltering. They have not bounced back as, as expected after COVID. And so uh, rather than uh, adding that into our emerging market portfolio, we've uh, hedged uh, towards the other emerging markets um, available to us to invest. The other thing that we've done to the portfolio here recently is with this idea that rates will be higher for longer, we've removed, removed a dedicated allocation to a low, low duration or shorter term allocation to fixed income. Uh, so we're, we're doing our best in a, a very difficult market um, to navigate. Uh, we do think, as I said earlier, rates will be higher for longer. We do not see um, this impending government shutdown as being having a major impact on the portfolio. Uh, I think that the macroeconomic factors of labor, inflation, consumer sentiment, uh, and corporate fundamentals are more what we're focused on. I'll pause there um, before I go to the next slide to talk about what we're thinking about kind of going forward. Okay. Okay, go ahead. C continue, Ellen. Okay. On uh, this last page, our current outlook, I've really given you some um, some foreshadowing here. Um, we, we have seen uh, growth be fairly resi resilient in 2023, and uh, we we at PFM expect growth to, to continue to improve, although it's not going to be significantly strong growth. It's going to be more that two and a half to three percent level that I talked about earlier. Uh, profit margins on the corporate side are stabilizing, although we are seeing some earnings estimates being cut here. Um, that's what's um, giving the market some cause for pause here. Uh, and we still see small and mid-cap valuations remaining um, attractive so if one thing that the investment committee would be considering potentially is to increase our allocation there but right now market sentiment remains against us and so we're not fighting the market on the international side uh you know uh, valuations here actually are a little bit more attractive than valuations domestically uh, longer term, we haven't seen as strong growth out of the international markets as we've seen domestically. And so uh, we had an underweight to international and we have brought that to uh, a market weight based upon our targets. We have added as well, as I said earlier, to international small cap and to emerging um, ex-China. So we are watching um, global financial conditions um, as they, they materialize. Um, but we are fairly positive on the international economy overall as well. On the fixed income side, we do expect rates to be higher for longer. We are um, finding value in credit uh, and still remain uh, overweight to corporate credit in the portfolio and have brought the portfolio to what we call a neutral duration, uh, so no longer uh, shorter than the market. That, that concludes my comments, unless you have any questions. Thank you, Ellen. That was very thorough. No. Yeah, it is. I mean, my only comment, and I'm not, it's not a criticism, but th this, the, the numbers are about three months old. I uh, don't know if there's some way we can tighten that up a little. Uh, I, know well, I know you're retiring. Congratulations on that. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not you. your problem. <laughs> uh, the value of the portfolio as of Friday um, was about $31.6 million. Uh, I will remind you that you're beginning to take money out of this portfolio to pay for your retiree health benefits. Uh, John, I don't have uh, up-to-date numbers. I can tell you that a 60-40 portfolio um, just invested at the benchmark 
uh, the return of that portfolio on a year-to-date basis is about six and a half percent. Uh, I don't have um, updated numbers for uh, the period ending September 30 until a couple of weeks from now. Um, so I appreciate that uh, these numbers are stale, um, but you have there the market value as of last Friday. And uh, I would expect that the portfolio's return is somewhere in that 6.5% yeah. return on a year-to-date basis. Thank you. So um, to your comment, uh, President Powell, uh, I think we um, had been trying to get the financial committee together uh, to review these, but uh, recognizing that it's difficult for staff to schedule those, uh, I think what we'll do is move these briefings, uh, as Carla mentioned, to a six-month basis, and we'll schedule it so that the briefings are, uh, are a little bit more current. To, uh, to the analysis and the data that's yeah. available. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So something we can do to help them out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right. Perfect. But uh, yeah, this was this was a scheduling issue more than anything. Else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Yeah. I think that covers it, right? Is that okay, Carla? Did I overcommit there? No, you're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, you're wonderful too. Aww. <laughs> Good. Wow, so friendly. This brings us to the board comments and um, request for future agenda items. Do we, uh, Director Nelson, comments? No comments this morning. Aguilar. No, sir. Bianco. No. I, I do have a quick comment, and that's uh, I had mentioned uh, last at the last meeting that we were working with the state water board on a on hosting the. I think it's the fourth meeting of the advisory group um, here in the Valley, so we're still continuing to work on that uh, with the uh, communication staff and Sylvia. And uh, I'm, I'm making this comment because there might be a need to bring before the board a budget request if we don't if we don't find a spot where where we might have some budget to uh, help with um, some of the logistics. Uh, since we're hosting, I did offer that uh, we might be uh, open to uh, paying for some things like the tour bus, uh, hosting lunch. Um, so as you are aware, that group is made up of uh, 20 uh, advisory group members that meet with the State Water Board throughout the year. We've been part of that advisory group uh, since its inception back in 2019. Um, and so these are uh, folks from across the state that represent small communities, that represent water agencies, they represent nonprofit organizations, and, and they meet with the state water board uh, throughout the year to advise them on how to, uh, how to prioritize projects, um, a lot of which um, are projects that we participate, that they were part of. And so um, if uh, staff is working right now to come up with some numbers, we don't have those numbers yet, but um, if there's a need to bring that to the board for approval, we'll, we'll bring that to the board. And so I just wanted to make you aware. Thank you. Thank you. I can't remember what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> Should we pause? <laughs> I am pausing. <laughs> it's not coming to me. Oh, um, I had a request for an interview and I don't know how much of it's going to be um, related to Colorado River or reductions in elevation building on Lake Mead or any of that or the two, 2026 rewrite of the 2007 shortage criteria but just wanted to put that out there it's going to be look like Thursday morning on for KSQ I think they're doing a whole package on this as she mentioned she's talking to IID but I think they're more interested in, like, they want to talk to a farmer. I don't think, I think I'm going to be wearing my farmer hat, not my water district hat, but it'll probably cross over into both. Do you need anything on our end? Oh. Do you want to do it here? Do you want to do it in your offices? Or? I think I'm probably doing it outside somewhere. Oh. She mentioned drone. I don't think we want to fly a drone in here. Plus, <laughs> 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 why would you? But anyways, um, just... I just want you to know um, mm -hmm. if there's anything newsy 
on on that on those topics. Let me know. I can get you a confidential uh, uh, term sheet that you could yeah. <laughs> share. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'll look at it without divulging it. I mean, yeah, it's always yeah. good to know these things. Yeah, I'll get it to you. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. Do you want us to try and probe to see uh, where she wants to go with this? Oh, I'll, I was going to ask her that. It'll. I know it's going to cover both. Okay. She mentioned you know shortages and flooding, both. Yeah, uh, it, I I think it's I think it's I, I talked to her too, and it's more about uh, a farmer's perspective of uh, the lake conditions, and then looking out to <clears throat> 2026, John. So I think you got it right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is this um, Angela Chen? Angela yeah. Chen, yeah. Yeah, but I think they want to see farms and. Mm -hmm. Looking at a farm today, you're going to want to see the ones that got hurt, right? I mean, you would think with the flooding. Anyways, we'll, we haven't figured it all out yet. I mean, literally just scheduled it this minute ago. Uh, that's all I had. Um, any requests for future agenda items by the board? Hearing none, board meeting reports. Let's start with the first one, August 17th. Uh, CV Energy, uh, Director Aguilar. Well, John, that was like a month and a half ago, so. Um, <laughs> but I did, I did go back and look at my notes. So, um, yeah, the primary topic, uh, Jim was there as well as um, Rick, if, if Jim wants to, uh, to chime in. But the primary discussion item was, of course, the LAFCO study, uh, which is under uh, pretty major scrutiny right now as being inadequate in terms of its recommendations on the governance structure, which at this point appears to be the, um, the Joint Powers Authority. I think they're headed in that direction, um, it appears. But they've extended the comment period on the study <coughs> until uh, mid-October mm -hmm. from the end of uh, September, end of August. And uh, so far, and we have a summary, I think the entire board saw, there have been a number of uh, agencies who have submitted comments and, you know, the general theme of the comments are that the study is inadequate and that there needs to be more financial analysis included uh, and, and provided by IID, which um, has been very slow in coming. So uh, that's needed to complete the analysis, and um, we'll see where we are at the end of the comment period. There also was one other item, which was a, a poll replacement uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I asked for a map of where the poles were being replaced, and it was quickly shot down. So mm -hmm. um, they didn't didn't want to provide that for some bizarre reason. But that was it. Keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for serving Too many on that. Polls. Sure. Yeah. September thirteenth, a little more current. Um, this was a meeting with staff on water use objectives, Director Nelson. Yeah. So the um, the state water. Um, uh, Resources Control Board has put together a tool that um, uh, online that uh, shows what districts need to reduce to meet their obligations under um, um, old ob obligations under SB8 and new obligations coming up uh, uh, in the future that will reduce uh, uh, personal water use from 55 gallons per person to 44 gallons per person to 42 gallons per person. And um, so they've developed this online tool that uh, monitors uh, domestic use, commercial and industrial use, uh, agricultural use, uh, uh, recreational use, and, um, and you can go and, and toggle the switches. And uh, so uh, I was kind of getting together with uh, Scott and Jim about uh, how that tool works to figure out how it works. I know Ian uh, James had had an uh, article in the LA Times that uh, showing how different agencies were going to have to reduce their water use by certain percentages by different years, and I just wanted to understand the inner workings of uh, that tool. It's rather fascinating, um, and we're not quite sure where they're getting some of the data, uh, but uh, uh, a large portion of the data is from the reports that uh, uh, that Scott and his team are, are getting to the the, the board, so um, uh, interesting process, and uh, I was interested in <coughs> and met with those guys. And 
So you had all this other stuff on the same day? Yeah, on the same day. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, it was a busy day. Um, <laughs> and I'll just go through it. So um, I didn't make the tour in the morning of the Palo Verde Irrigation District, but I did make the CRB meeting uh, in uh, Blythe. Um, uh, it was pretty well attended uh, for Blythe. That was good. Um, uh, we received our, um, our Colorado River reports, uh, the salinity reports, and obviously the system is doing very well. It has uh, over 5 million acre feet more water than it did last year. It's up to from 24% up to the 40% 40, 40 of total system capacity range. So it's doing very well. Uh, that was good. Um, we uh, discussed then at the six agency committee um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember, it seems long ago too, but only two weeks. Uh, but we, uh, we discussed um, uh, some of the negotiation uh, representation uh, at, the, at the meetings with the lower basin and the upper basin, looking for a greater degree of inclusivity uh, from the Section 5 contractors uh, versus the Colorado River Board, as well as um, uh, having staff participate uh, more in in that as well, uh, so that was a concern that everyone had, and um, uh, there was actually a, a Section Five contractors meeting last Friday in San Diego, uh, which Steve Abbott attended on our behalf. Uh, none of us could make it, so uh, Steve was there, and we we had a, a fair amount of discussion before that happened. So. Um, that was good, and out of that came a term sheet that I'll share with okay, you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is, am I remembering this wrong? Um, is the six agency committee hosting that um, commemoration of the QSA anniversary thing? Yeah, and, so and, next and next month there's a um, commemoration of the, um, of the QSA in San Diego. Uh, the um, six agency committee. So how it's divided is the Colorado River Board are the representatives from the agencies, uh, right. but the funding comes from the six agency committee. So it's a separate group, and then there's a Colorado River Authority that uh, funds uh, some of the um, uh, advocation for different bills and legislature yeah. and so forth. So I'm sure it's the Colorado River Authority that's that's hosting oh, that, that may uh, be. in San Diego coming up. So you know, and that timing of that corresponds with our evening board meeting. I believe it's the same time, right? So I don't know what we're doing about that. Yeah, I I, I haven't been involved with that, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm coming to the. Board I know meeting, I saw the, I saw all the invitations, but uh, I haven't seen I'm, an invitation. So oh uh, really? Yeah. Well, IID put one out, um, came in from Susie, and that's for uh, Tuesday, October 10th at 5 p.m. in El Centro. Uh, yeah, in El Centro. It's not in yeah. San Diego. And there's one in San Diego. There's and there's, there's one in San Diego also. Yeah, on November 8th, the uh, San Diego County Water Authority is having a um, 20th anniversary celebration. So that's Wednesday, November 8th from 5 to 7.30. All right, so the, the one that corresponds with our evening meeting is the October 10th one in El Centro. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I can, I'll, I'll make sure Sylvia's got these. Yeah, she can send and, them and Susie, Su Susie's email was more of a FYI, the invitation's coming, like yeah. the real yeah. invitations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's well, funny, I, I haven't seen one invitation. Maybe I'm not invited. And maybe they scratch you off the list. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> maybe you got lucky. What'd you do? <laughs> maybe you got lucky. <laughs> yeah, Susie's note just came to Robert, John, mm -hmm. Costello, and myself. Anyways, yeah. those are happening. Okay. Uh, bus yeah, busy thank day that day. Thank you, yeah. Uh, September 14th, Coachella Conservation Commission, Director Bianco. Uh, the final phase of the Bighorn sheep fence um, is, uh, is uh, starting to take place. Uh, that's the one where it goes up and over uh, the mountain. Um, they did talk about how they were very thankful with CBWD on the fence that they did put in. I had never seen it before, but I guess there's these debris uh, gates at the bottom. They're about two feet tall. Uh, the full panel that allowed debris to come through when water flows. That they're very thankful that CBWD gave them that recommendation and they put those in because they worked wonderful during this last storm. 
Oh, nice. So instead of taking down the fence, the debris came through, came under. I'd never seen him before. I don't know if you guys have ever seen him before. No, sheep go through there too. The sheep don't go through there. <laughs> it's like on a hinge or something? It's on a hinge. Yeah. Yeah, it oh, just lets the branches and the, the debris to come underneath it and go through and wow. and not Pretty destroy cool. that fence. So, well, good idea. Great. And okay. then a few parcels in Palm Springs, small parcels that were purchased, like yeah. always. Till those sheep figure out that they could just put a put a branch in there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Let their friends start. ride some debris. That's interesting. All right. So then you also had the same day. That I you, wasn't at the other one. That used to be the E and E. Now it's Energy and Sustainability. They changed the name. I think. Coming more current. Yeah. Okay. September nineteenth, uh, there was a we had a pre, I guess, update for the principals meeting with the Agro Caliente Mediation. Um, uh, Director Strada or Vice President Strada was on there as well. Me and he and I. Um, September twentieth, disadvantaged community uh, task force. I did not attend that, but I I know you were there. Yeah, I was there at the regular meeting on updates. I think we had a presentation that was unique. Um, it was a good presentation. I forget the title. Do you remember, Jim, the risk assessment or what was it? The What was it that... that the, the local hazard mitigation, oh, right, mitigation yeah. plan. So that, that's... Uh, I don't know if that if we had that specifically to, to meet some sort of requirement of, for outreach, but, but I think it was presented to a good group. Um, and uh, it was very, very well put together. Thank you. September 21st, Salt and Sea Authority. <clears throat> I was not there. I was not there. I was away. Oh, okay. yeah, right. Okay. So I did not attend. Um, additional meetings, I had two. On um, September 20th, I know Director Nelson was also on the Zoom for the Coachella Irrigated Lands Coalition. Very interesting meeting. I do appreciate uh, CPWD's uh, involvement in that and, Z and Zoe uh, offering to help. We had a bid for our new requirement for fish tissue sampling and the, the co our contractor was willing to do it for $20,000. And <laughs> For a fishing trip in I the can, white water. You know, I can take a I can take a three day all inclusive trip to Alaska and go really go fishing for less than that. <laughs> and here we are going right over here to to try to catch a fish. For are you including your fillet service and your uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all fish bag yes. and all that? That's included yeah, too. Yeah, all right. First I mean, class too. No, no, I, I, I you I can do you. it for five thousand a day, and th these guys are. I mean, which is a lot of money, and they're above that, and it's for yeah. one day. Anyways, um, there may be a better way to do that. We're we're essentially going to tell the regional board that uh, it's not in our budget, so we might have to wait. Um, yeah. So uh, obviously, you know, for you all, the the state board issues a, an order. The regional board enforces the order uh, for us to uh, report. Um, uh, for, for farmers to report uh, fertilizer use, um, not water use, but fertilizer use, have best management practices, and be involved in um, uh, monitoring and reporting to the regional board these activities uh, to make sure that uh, we're protecting the aquifer as, as an agricultural group. Um, so we work together as, uh, in this Irrigated Lands Coalition to reduce the cost. Um, and we've had a number of uh, organizations drop off the list. A number of organizations never join the list. And so uh, it's getting rather expensive on a per acre basis uh, because of the lack of participation uh, in that. Um, the coalition doesn't have any enforcement capabilities. So um, they're, you know, the regional board is supposed to do the enforcement and they're not. And so it's causing these uh, budget constraints. And so we're going back to the regional board and as a board and saying, listen, we don't have the money for this fish sampling because you guys don't enforce an order and we can't, we can't you know, sustain this. So, uh, so those are some interesting things going on. And I do want to say how much we appreciate uh, Zoe's uh, 
um, not really commitment to the group, mm -hmm. but uh, influence on the group and involvement and collaboration. Yeah. Uh, currently, she's working very hard on establishing some uh, criteria in, in, the, in the Coachella Valley Salt and Nutrient Management yes. Plan. And it, uh, there's a lot of information that we can share in this regard, and, and that's going very well. Uh, in terms of nitrogen applications in the agricultural region, so sure. I, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, thanks for for that. Uh, I'll pass it along if she's not listening. Yeah, to well said. And then um, September 25th, yesterday, we had a principals uh, meeting on the Agua Caliente mediation, and uh, Vice President Estrada and I were there. Any other meetings we need to add? Yeah, I have one. Uh, on September 6th, I attended the 2024 uh, AOP consul second consultation. That's the um, uh, the Bureau has three consultations on the annual operating plan. And it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of wordsmithing and so forth. And uh, it's, it's fun to be there and see who's doing the wordsmithing and why they're doing the wordsmithing. And so the Upper Basin, uh, particularly uh, the Colorado Conservation Committee Executive Director in there, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's interesting to see what their, what their viewpoints are on this. So uh, I attended that on uh, Zoom, I guess. Thank you. Any others? Yes, yeah. so, President, I had a meeting on September 18th. I met with Antonio Ortega, Government Affairs and Communications Officer for IID. Uh, he just wanted to get together, no, no real agenda other than to say uh, he's transferred over to the Coachella Valley. Uh, he officially lives in the city of Coachella. Um, I think he's been doing the rounds, uh, just making that announcement. I, I'm sure he's met with some of our staff. I know he's met with some of the other cities. And so um, he's around. Uh, he wants to, I imagine, meet with some of you. Are so you still with IID? He is still with right. IID. Oh, so yeah. he wised up and came up. <laughs> so, so he's around. Uh, I'm kidding. And, I'm and, kidding. Uh, and he'll, uh, he'll, uh, he, he said he's going to reach out to you. Okay, great. And he wants to meet with you. So, right. um, that's that's what he wanted to announce, and so that's what we're going for. Good enough. Mm -hmm. Any others? Is, is there a motion to approve per diem on the meetings reported on? So move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 5 0. Uh, general manager report. Yes, sir. Until uh, this week, I was going to say we had very few COVID cases, but now I know at least we have one um, and possibility of a second one. But other than that, the numbers are down. Um, we are seeing a little bit more activity um, than we had recently. Uh, and we continue to work with uh, the city's city staff. Um, we continue to respond to uh, questions from uh, residents about uh, stormwater issues. Um, and we continue to recover. I think uh, the support we're getting from Metropolitan has worked well. I got a drone uh, video from uh, Dan yesterday. I don't, uh, I, I don't, I did I send it out or not? Yeah, I saw it. I, saw I knew it. I was trying to send it out, but sometimes I get yeah. distracted. <laughs> So if I don't yeah. do things right away, I, I lose track of them. Um, but I think uh, overall we are in pretty good shape. I do appreciate the fact that there is still a great deal that needs to be done with regard to stormwater protection uh, within the valley, and um, we are focused on that. Uh, it'll just take some time and money. That's all, guys. I mean, what I saw was that we plan to accept water at Whitewater. October second. That's pretty soon. I just said early. I just said early October. But it, October second. Yeah. Well, that's the goal, right? So that's uh -huh. pretty good. Well, yeah, I mean, you that's, were. That's you very impressive. Two months and then down to one month and then. Uh, very impressive. Double the equipment, so. Very impressive. Well, yeah, with metropolitan support, we were able to cut the uh, anticipated yeah. projected delivery date in half. So. Well, yeah, the rocks really appear after when you put water in it again. Seems like that there's no rocks. There used to be rockier than that. You gotta put it. They, they, they have to start rocks. really slow. Okay. Yeah, he has to put it in. It seemed from the video that it just seemed like it was all dirt, and I know it's not all dirt. It's got rocks in it. We had to rebuild. Um, so so somebody's got to tell you to get to the microphone here shortly. That's okay. Dan said <laughs> they had. Okay. Dan said they had to rebuild. That's okay. good. That's where rebuild. Jim, Jim did you? Uh, 
I, I missed the derby. I know there was like a big derby out in Lake Huia. Um, I did not go to the derby. And I was not able to make I went last year, but I just was That's wondering if you had if you had heard anything mm. about it. I had so, not. Who had the biggest fish? Well, I just, you know how the event went. It was a big, big event. <laughs> we'll see pictures of it. All right. Thank you. April. Okay, then uh, council comments? Yes, I had just planned to follow up on on the comment from Director Nelson about the urban water use efficiency standards. Uh, the state board is, ha is holding their public hearing on October 4th, 2023 to establish or to get public comment on the actual regulations to implement those objectives. And the regulations are quite in depth in terms of, of the formulas for indoor use, outdoor use, um, tracking of water loss, things of that na uh, nature, and I'm sure our staff is all on top of that. Thank you. Do we have any departmental reports today? No. No, sir. Uh, at this time, the board will recess into closed session to consider the three items on the agenda. Following closed session, we will reconvene open session to report out. Yeah, yeah. I have. I have. I have. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The regular meetings here by reconvene. We do not have any reportable action from closed session. And with no further business, we are adjourned.